wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video we're going to be talking about the most important and probably the most famous scientific debate in the history of science, the so-called Great Debate. But it's actually something that we've already forgotten about, and unfortunately it's between two people that most people don't even know about. So let's discuss why this was important and what we can learn from it today, and welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So when it comes to science, there's no shortage of debate, mostly because people don't always agree on what's really happening in nature and what's really going on in the universe to begin with. We obviously have a lot of different debates on what exactly is dark matter, dark energy, what exactly is happening with, for example, things like fast radio bursts. So in other words, there's quite a lot of things that people don't agree on. But the most famous debate happened exactly 100 years ago from when I'm making this video. This was in April of 1920. And it was actually between two people. Two people that unfortunately have been kind of lost to history. Unless, of course, you're an astronomer. The first person was this wonderful person, Heber Doust Curtis. This was a somewhat elderly scientist, very experienced and also quite well respected. But he was a great speaker, had really strong voice, and was also very well known for his ability to debate really well. On the other hand, we also had this other person, the much younger and slightly less experienced Harlow Shapley, who used to be a journalist and then decided to follow his dream of becoming an astronomer and eventually was aiming to become the director of Harvard College Observatory, which you can probably imagine was one of the top posts back then. And both of these gentlemen were actually aiming at some sort of a post, so the point of the debate was to kind of prove their knowledge and also to show the scientific community that not only were they both quite knowledgeable individuals, but also that their perspective of the universe was the correct one. And so, what exactly was this debate about? Well, it's actually really simple, yet somewhat difficult. They were actually discussing the idea of the universe, the size of the universe. They were trying to figure out, although figure out is probably not the best word because they didn't really figure anything out, they were just debating things, they were trying to argue the point of Milky Way being a galaxy or it being the entire universe. So let me actually retrace this slightly. Back then, we didn't really know how big the universe was. As a matter of fact, most scientists back then assumed that the entire universe was essentially what we saw in the night skies and essentially the Milky Way was it. Milky Way was the universe. Everything else we've seen and everything else we've observed, such as for example what you're about to see right there, all of these were called nebula, which were very likely, according to the scientists back then, either undeveloped star systems or some other unusual clouds that formed over the period um, of possibly millions of years somewhere in the vicinity of the Milky Way. And so all of these were seen as essentially nebula, something that we have plenty of today as well. And this is exactly what Shapley was arguing for. He essentially tried to prove the point that what we're seeing in the night skies is essentially the universe, and the universe was the Milky Way galaxy. So here you'll see all of the other galaxies slowly disappearing. This was Shapley's view, and this was actually the view of many other scientists back then. There was really no other proof uh, to actually show anything otherwise. And some of his points really made sense. So for example, he um, was trying to use different argumentative points to prove that the Milky Way galaxy was actually 10 times bigger than what we initially thought, which he was able to prove quite elegantly. But back then, uh, obviously, we didn't really know how big any of this was to begin with which, by the way, was actually the foundation of most of his points. Everything we were seeing in the night skies was actually just part of this much, much larger universe, galaxy, whatever you want to call it, that he referred to as the Milky Way. He was also trying to argue for the point that all of these other nebula were just part of the Milky Way, and one of the major ways he tried to prove it is by using another astronomer's finding. This person right here, Adrian van Manen, was actually able to show that these so-called spiral nebula, as they referred to them back then, were actually visibly spinning. In other words, by looking at various um, photographic plates from different periods, Van Manen was actually able to see the motion inside the spiral galaxies. And this was sort of one of the main points. If we can see the motion in these spiral galaxies, it probably suggests that they're much smaller than we imagine them to be, because otherwise it would actually violate the whole speed of light limit. There's no way that matter in these spiral nebula was moving faster than it really was. And the papers published back in 1916 even showed the uh, rotation and sort of the location of various star motions that were detected by Van Manen and his team. 
And he also suggested that some of the nova we observed, these really large bright explosions that come in from the Andromeda, were so bright that they were able to outshine the entire galaxy, suggesting that they must have been much much closer to us than some of the other scientists were implying. In other words, he had quite a lot of really solid arguments suggesting that Milky Way was the universe, and that there was nothing else except for our own galaxy. Now, okay, what about the other guy? The older, but much more liberal in his thinking, Curtis. Well, what Curtis was suggesting was that what we were looking at were so-called island universes. And Milky Way was just one of them. Although most of the arguments were actually focused on this island universe right here. This is known as M31, or back then it was known as M31. Today we know this as Andromeda. Now, first of all, Curtis actually did agree with Shapley that it's very likely that Milky Way is much larger than we really think. And also, just like uh, Shapley was able to prove, it's very likely that the location of the solar system is not in the center of the galaxy, but actually a little bit closer to the sides. We know today that this is actually true. But he was also able to show that the Andromeda galaxy right here actually had a lot more of these nova as they were known than uh, Shapley reported. As a matter of fact, there were so many of them going on all the time that the only other explanation would be that it's actually a separate island universe. It's not really inside the Milky Way at all. He was also able to uh, show that these so-called dust lanes, as you can see right here, these dark lines that form the spirals, were actually present both in the Milky Way and other island universes, which would be kind of unusual, because why would they be in these other shapes that are technically supposed to be part of the Milky Way? He also showed that the nova, or I guess you can technically call it supernova now, were much dimmer in the Andromeda galaxy than they were in the nearby regions, suggesting of course that very large distances were involved here. Also, the apparent motion of many of these island universes was actually too high to be gravitationally attached to the uh, main Milky Way galaxy, suggesting that they were probably part of something else or were completely separate from everything. And also, when they looked at various light spectra of these so-called nebula and island universes, they didn't really match any known stars or anything else we kind of know for granted. So nothing from the Milky Way from the vicinity seemed to match anything else that we were observing, such as, for example, the Andromeda. And so, in reality, both of these scientists were making good points, and many astronomers that were listening to them actually um, kind of agreed with a lot of what was being said. But I think for the most part, most astronomers actually did agree with Shapley. In other words, the more conservative view that the Milky Way was the whole universe, and that the Andromeda Galaxy was just another part of this universe. Technically, Curtis sort of lost. But here's the thing though. This debate, even though it was really kind of famous and I guess back then scientists did like to debate and argue a lot, does not unfortunately demonstrate to us anything scientific. As a matter of fact, it really is important to make this distinction here. Debates and arguments are not science, because today we know that everything that was argued back then, and everything that technically Shapley was certain about, and many other astronomers were certain about as well, today is completely wrong. For example, we know that the universe is much, 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 much larger than any of these scientists could even imagine. As a matter of fact, it's very likely it's even larger than we currently can imagine. The more we learn about the universe, the dark energy, and of course, the so-called quantum mechanics, the more we realize there is just a lot of things going on that we can't even possibly think of right now. And the biggest discovery only came three years later, which is essentially known today as the day that the universe was discovered. This was, of course, discovered by the famous Edwin Hubble, and it was this picture right here. This is literally the only piece of evidence we needed to change everyone's mind forever. And this is science at work. Evidence means so much more than good words and ability to argue. And what was it that changed everything? It's this right here, these three letters, VAR which stands for variable, because back then Edwin Hubble discovered a Cepheid variable inside the Andromeda galaxy. And back then we already knew that Cepheid variables were very unique stars. They allow us to measure distances very precisely, and whatever Cepheid says is probably the distance. Now, if you don't actually know what Cepheid variables are, in a nutshell, we can quite easily use these stars to measure distances to various objects in space, and we've done so for a very long time. So once the star was discovered, and once Hubble was able to show that this is actually a star located in the Andromeda galaxy, this was essentially the day when we've discovered the entire universe and realized that, well, turns out, even though Shapley won the debate, 
technically Curtis was right all along. But once again, remember, their names are not as popular today as the name Hubble. And this kind of tells you something. Scientific evidence will always win over simple words or simple arguments. And most of the time, some of the more extraordinary assumptions and implications require a lot more extraordinary proof. So basically, without evidence, you cannot really say something is a fact. And this is literally science at work. But today though, we don't really rely on these debates anymore, at least uh, not in the scientific community. Most of the discussions and dialogue is actually more or less done in real time, usually even online on platforms like Twitter, for example. And for the most part, most scientists usually kind of communicate before coming to final conclusions. But obviously, even today, we're making quite a lot of different assumptions that are probably going to be completely wrong in about 100 years from now. So by the time it's 2120, it's very likely someone else is going to be, well, making a video or whatever it is that we're using in the future, talking about how our hubris, our arrogance was a little bit too much. We assumed that the universe was a certain way, but it's actually something completely different. But this is also the reason why we can't really certainly say what exactly is dark matter or dark energy or what it isn't. We also don't really know what FRBs are. We have no idea if alien life exists and there's really not enough proof to suggest anything is anything right now. Once we have a definitive proof similar to this picture right here from Edwin Hubble about these particular topics, we'll know for a fact that this is what's happening. But the best thing we can do right now is just wait for more evidence before making any conclusive decisions. But also remember that people make mistakes and this is exactly what happened with Adrian van Manen's observation that he was able to observe the actual motion of spiral galaxies. He didn't. He made a mistake. And this mistake was later proven. The apparent effects of motion he was observing by looking at these photographic plates were actually created by a slight difference in sharpness of stars on various plates. And some of them were actually a little bit more blurry than others, and this created this apparent effect of motion. This is something we know of quite well today. But because of these observations and these mistakes, the error became systematic. He actually had a very major problem that resulted in almost complete rewriting of what we believed about these galaxies. And this error is obviously not the first and not the last time scientists make mistakes. So here, it's really important for us to not be arrogant and to actually admit it. Yeah, this was a mistake and we need to fix it. Which is exactly what happened after Hubble's discovery and of course, what followed afterwards was a transformation of our understanding of the entire universe. But unfortunately, even after what seems to be a hundred years now, we still haven't really learned to think scientifically and we still rely on opinions, debates and arguments way too much. Even though, as it was shown hundred years ago, it was actually wrong. Completely wrong. Even though you can formulate a really, really good argument and you can pretty much prove anything given enough evidence, it does not mean that this is how the universe or anything else in science works. And this is really important to remember. This is literally the most important lesson out of this. 100 years later, because we have so many arguments today about concepts that are scientifically proven and factual and people still don't really agree with them and tend to argue against them, it's really important for us to reflect on what we're doing and what happened 100 years ago. The Great Debate was actually a really good example of why scientific evidence matters. But that's really it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also, consider supporting this channel Patreon, it does help me quite a lot. Alternatively, you can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.